to be here. So one of the things that we're attempting to do this summer, and it requires everybody's cooperation, um, how many of you if, you, if you serve in the life of our church in some way, shape, or fashion, would you just please stand, if you would, just wherever you are? Thank you so much. So thank, thank you so much for doing so. They are here to help create excellent environments, so it's possible for you to attend as well. We unashamedly and really very openly need everyone to be jumping on a team for the fall. And there's all sorts of things you can do in the life of our church. We're beginning a parking ministry. We've got people that help to take care of our watch ministry to make sure that your things are safe while you're inside here. Certainly working with children. I mean, some people, if you just love to hold babies, man, that's a great thing and a great place to go and invest so that moms can have a moment to, with God and with others. And so we just want to invite you to be part of the life and service teams of our church. If you're not already... It's easy as well. The QR code in front of you gives you a place where you can serve, and there's lots of different ways you can do so. But we wanted to invite one of our leaders who helps us. This is Heather Martin. She's coming out today to share with us how she got here. So you guys welcome Heather. Give her a big hand. Good morning. Just did such a great job in our first service. Heather works with our preschoolers, right? Yes, I'm in the, usually with the two-year-olds. Fantastic. Hey, that's pretty good right there. So if you got a terrible two-year-old, uh, you, you can turn over to Heather for a little while. <laughs> we love Sage. But they're, but they're not terrific, terrible, they're terrific two-year-olds. They're thrilling three-year-olds, right? That's right anyway. We love it. But Heather, so tell us how you got here. How did you get to the point? So uh, my now 16-year-old uh, started coming when she was probably 12 or 13 with friends and uh, they started coming with on Wednesday nights to Collision. Um, started, they started their own carpool with uh, other parents and I became a part of the carpool. And uh, it just became more frequent, uh, wanting to come on Sundays. So when they started coming on Sundays, we were like, well, we're jumping in now. And I had an infant at the time and we would tag team because I would walk past Kids Point and was like, that's, that's a lot back there. That's, <laughs> there's much going on back there. So I'm not really sure I can jump into that just yet. So we uh, started tag teaming. My husband would come with our daughter at the time, and, or I would come. And then we both kind of started fighting to come on a Sunday. Uh, so <laughs> we decided maybe it was time to get our toddler into Kids Point. Um, so once I had her back there, I was like, someone is back here watching my baby so that I can go enjoy service um, and get my cup filled for the week. Uh, so I should give back and uh, give someone else the same opportunity. Yeah. And it's been amazing. Awesome. So you said something in the first service about, so what are some of the reasons that keep you coming back? What kind of happens in the room when you're helping with, with two-year-olds? How, by the way, how many of you can imagine being in a room full of two-year-olds? So, okay, there we go. We have a job for you, Brittany. There we go. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, tell us, because she lives it in her own life every day. Um, first of all, I don't know how the teachers do it all day. Uh, one hour is, is a lot, and it's, it's enough. Um, it fills my cup for the week. Um, but, but it fills you up. That's pretty it, cool. It is. It does. It does. It is my refresher. Um, like, People say, you know, go to sleep, you wake up and you feel refreshed. No, come in here on Sunday morning, being back, being here during worship and service, um, and then being back there with the kids, uh, connecting with them, uh, getting to know their personalities, um, seeing changes, watching them grow um, has it's just been amazing. Uh, and then watching them come in, being new and not really knowing what the class is, who I am. Yeah and them becoming more and more comfortable each week uh, with our routine and what we're doing. Um, and just they'll eventually, you know, start coming up to you, wanting you to play food with them, or I've got cars rolling all over me. We've got stickers. Yeah. We do Go Danny Go um, just <laughs> to get them involved. And, uh, you know, we're back there dancing and freezing. So if you come back and we're a hot mess, sweating, it's because we've been doing Go Danny Go. I so. love it. I love it. Well, thank you <laughs> so much. It's a lot of fun. Thanks so much for investing your life in the life of our kids. You have children of your own. They're how, what ages? I have a 16-year-old and a three-year-old. Wow, that's amazing. That's awesome. That's fantastic. I have two only children. Two only <laughs> children. Kind of like that, right? We're just so grateful for your ministry in the life of our church. And um, was it hard to get involved? No. <laughs> did, did we help you know what you needed to do? Yes. Uh, walking in, um, everyone just comes and greets you and guides you and tells you exactly where you need to go, when you need to be there, how you need to help. 
um, encouraging. Everyone is encouraging um, and welcoming. Like, you just open the doors and everyone's there. It's what I teach them back there in the two-year-old classroom. You know, the here's the church, here's the steeple. Open, open the it doors, up. see there's the people. people. There we go. There we so go. that's what we're also learning in the two-year-old classroom. Fantastic. <laughs> we're trying to get the hands together there. Uh, I need but, to go to your class. That's kind of on my level. I can handle that. <laughs> you know, it's, you got to get down with the two-year-olds. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but everyone here, it's so, so easy to get involved. Um, first year of doing VBS. Yeah. We had amazing time. It was, it was a lot. It was tiring, it, but it was so much fun. Thank so you much so fun. much, Heather, for doing this. And the other great thing about the life and ministry of our church is because there's cross-pollination going on between children and students. A lot of our students who are in student ministry that attend here on Wednesday evenings actually volunteer on Sunday mornings to be a part of helping to make things happen and stuff like that. So we have adults and students who are helping. We're just so grateful, Heather, for your willingness to be with us today. Thank you so much. Okay, as Heather's leaving, I've got a guest that's going to come out just in just a moment. Um, several of you a couple weeks ago had requested a copy of the book that we had purchased in uh, multiples called Israel the Miracle. So um, we've got the names of some people that made reservations. We've got more copies of those in, so you can see somebody at the uh, Next Steps area after the service. I know, for instance, Barry, I know you got one. Brad, I know you got one. Um, and Joe, maybe you got one as well, too. So those are out there. If your name's on the list, you can do that. And we do have some extras, too, um, just if you kind of make sure that those that need to get them, that put their names on, we get them first. And they're free. They cost us about 25 bucks a piece, but we wanted to invest in you to let you know about the importance of Israel and God's plan. Man, the, the world is gone crazy. And, and maybe yesterday in the attempted assassination attempt, which is really what it was, can maybe get us to start understanding the things that we have in common. And when we have differences, that we don't need to take out a rifle or a knife or a fist or our social media post to punch somebody out because you can do it that way too. Um, let, let's tone it down, folks, and let's tone the love of God up. All right, so today we're going to answer a question that's been asked in several different kinds of places. Um, what's the difference between the way we worship as Protestants, more about why we're called Protestants later, and the way Catholics worship. We are surrounded in our, our culture. The only uh, Benedictine college south of the Mason-Dixon line is Belmont Abbey. Um, I have great friends that work there, go there. We, we partner with Holy Angels, which has a ministry like no other to handicap children and that kind of stuff. So when somebody asked this question initially, they asked the question in this, this kind of way. Are, are we different from Catholics in what ways? And here's the way somebody actually said, what's the difference between Catholics and Christians? As if that's a binary choice. So today, we want to talk about what we have in common as Christ followers in different traditions and what are very different as far as that's concerned. So different people go different ways with this. Um, Nate, who works in our production area, so he's helping to make things happen today. Um, Grew up in a home where his father was a Southern Baptist preacher and his mother was the music minister. He went to church when the doors were open. He stayed until the doors were closed. He said, after rediscovering my belief in God, I didn't really know what to do with my faith. He believed in Jesus, but while in college, I started studying Roman history. I started learning about the Roman Catholic Church. The more I learned, the more I felt drawn to that church. Few things that really are called to me were the history, tradition, and the reverence of the church. It was something that was different than what he grew up in. I felt more at home being able to ask some questions. That's common. I wasn't really able to ask when I was growing up. Whether it's on this side or that side, that's a commonality. Getting clarity on many aspects of faith helped me to grow in my personal faith. And learning that the church predates the complete New Testament played a factor as well too. So the Bible, not as we know it now, but began to be put together very clearly by the time of the Catholic Church. That was the first kind of Bible that's pulled together. Ours is a little different. Well, more about that on another day, we could talk about how the Bible came together and what differs between ours and theirs. Then he says, the biggest thing that made me feel I belong was when I getting backlash from my Protestant family and when my future wife didn't want to get, become Catholic. I asked a priest what I should do. He said, and this is very wise, by the way, thank goodness for this priest, whoever he was, nobody's going to agree on everything. For those in your life who don't agree, just love them and pray for them. But always remember this, as long as we agree on the big things, we can discuss the little things. There will always be differences, Nate's words, between Catholics, Protestants, and the Orthodox faith. 
Orthodox is another dimension um, we're not going to talk about today. Um, there are things we can learn from each other and ways we can help each other to learn. The thing to remember is we are all followers of Christ and we believe he is the son of God. He did die for our sins and he loves all of us. Okay, so that's one perspective. My friend Keanu, who's coming out now, has a different perspective. So Keanu came from a Catholic background into a Protestant background. So just some background here. First, Keanu is my friend. Welcome to the stage again. You're going to see Keanu around our church for the next month or so. Um, we've hired him as a consultant. He's had some good experiences in serving churches in the past. And um, we want to just tighten up in the things we're doing here. Um, Keanu is not taking Brad's place. Everybody hear me? Okay. There's a nervous laughter there. Um, he's very capable, but... Keanu owns the Alchemy co-working space in downtown Gastonia. If you're interested in co-working and stuff like that, he's the master of that, and that's like the mission of his life, and he is ready to go. But also, he's helped us over the last several years with the Global Leadership Summit. Uh, just another little commercial. Tomorrow, the lowest rate to be part of the Global Leadership Summit will pass at midnight. If you are interested in coming, I encourage you to go to the Global Leadership Summit site. If you are one of those people that are out there, and you're going like, you know what? I want to do that, but I really can't afford to do it. Listen, if you're a leader, if you're serving in our church, if you are somebody sitting, you say, I need the leadership development. Because of the generosity of people in our church, we can have a limited number of tickets where we can give to people for free. But it costs us $139 a piece to do this out of the money that people give. But we choose to invest in leadership in that way. But Keanu and I became friends post-2020. Um, he began working in our community um, with Elevation Church years ago. Uh, he left Elevation to begin this co-working mission and consulting practice. So we welcome you to the stage. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Thank you, church, for having me. Absolutely. I want to take a moment first to honor Pastor Ray and how he's a pastor and a leader, not only within these walls and to this church, but to the community. And he's someone that even before I started calling the point my home church, uh, which it is now, you go? Uh, someone that's been a pastor to me, even just out in the community. And I always say this with the utmost honor and respect. I forget that he pastors an entire church. Not because of how he conducts himself. The, the, the spirit of God just flows on him, well, more so because of all that he does for the community. So thank you, Pastor Ray, for what you do. Thank you. Appreciate you. And thank you for sharing your pulpit with me today to yes, be sir. able to have this conversation, especially after a day like yesterday where more conversation needs to be encouraged. Oh, absolutely. If we don't agree or we don't see eye to eye, to be able to, to bridge the gap. Right. And as Pastor Ray mentioned, I was raised Catholic. And I, I, I say raised Catholic, but honestly, I was born Catholic. Any other uh, fellow Anybody Catholics, Catholic recovering background? Catholics in the room? Yeah, plenty, right? Uh, you, you're born into it. it. It's as much your culture as, you know, the, the Jewish people is, you know, they're Jew. They're born into it. So I was born and raised in New Mexico. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm definitely not from around here. But born and raised <laughs> in New Mexico and being raised Spanish and Mexican descent, it traces all the way back to 1493 and even beyond with the Spanish Inquisition and, you know, why that, you know, became what it was in the Mexican culture and all of us becoming converted to Catholicism. So it wasn't something that I believed. It was just something that I was. I couldn't change my Catholic faith no more than I could change my brown eyes, right? It was just something that was a part of me. But growing up in that, I was... I was baptized as a baby. I was sprinkled, you know, and, and then I went through First Holy Communion and I was looking forward to confirmation. And what it did was it started to set a standard that you have to work to be saved. You have to work to have a relationship with the Father. And all of that toil and all of that work and all of that mindset only led me to when I was 23 years old wanting to take my own life. Mm. And it led me to thinking that I can't do enough. I can't be enough. And I'm not helping, so I might as well just end it. Do you want me to go into my story? Yeah, have please some questions? do tell them. Absolutely. Please, please so, tell them your story. When I was uh, about eight or nine years old, um, was raised very, very poor. Parents were never married. Neither of them graduated from high school. Uh, my dad, after I was born, married another woman, and they had uh, two kids together. She had two of her own. So I was the only one that belonged to my dad. So I was raised in that household, and fast forward, I was nine years old, and my dad has attempted suicide five times in my life. Wow. And my stepmom decided to divorce him, take her two kids who he was raising, and their two kids that they had together, and leave to Alabama. 
And being raised in New Mexico, I was the first one in my family to get on a plane. I was flying to boot camp. I was 20 years old. Uh, you just don't get out. You don't get out and actually experience the world. So they might as well have been on Mars. And my dad was devastated by that, understandably. So his family, you know, he just lost it. But for me, selfishly, I was kind of thrilled because my dad was my best friend growing up. I had such a relationship with my father. You know, I knew I could always go to him. I'd wake up. Sometimes he'd take me to work because he was a laborer. He worked at a feedlot. Uh, not many feedlots around here. It's where your burgers come from. All right. A lot of them out in New Mexico. <laughs> so when he would take me to work, I would, you know, fall asleep in my, my, my pants and my boots and I'd just be waiting for him to wake me up to go to work. So I woke up and I'd always spend this time with my dad. But when my stepmom was around, I didn't get that kind of time. So she was leaving and selfishly, I was kind of excited but I didn't know how much pain my dad was going through. I didn't know what he was experiencing at the time. So fast forward uh, you know, a couple of months after she left and he didn't want to stay in his bedroom because it reminded him of his wife and I don't want him to be alone so I wouldn't stay in my room. So we'd sleep in the living room. He'd sleep on one couch and I'd sleep on another. Mm. And one evening, I had a much older sister that lived a couple blocks away. She worked at a gas station. She decided, she just felt like, hey, I'm gonna go check on them. It was about midnight. And the next thing I know, she's shaking me awake. I'm on the couch and she's telling me, hey, you got to get out of here. Run to my house. You can't be here. You got to get out of here. And I'm, you know, where's dad? I don't see him on the couch. Where are my shoes? What's going on? I came to find out a couple of maybe 30 minutes later, as I see the ambulance arrive, that my dad had went to a room and stabbed himself and tried to end his life. And that night I started asking a question. Even at nine years old, why would my dad leave me? Why did my dad not care enough? Why was I not enough, right? That my own dad, if he didn't care to stick around, I couldn't have a relationship with other friends. I couldn't have a relationship with a coach or, you know, a woman or a, a, a boss. Because if my own father, who was my best friend, could leave me, I can't trust you, Pastor Ray. Yeah. You'll just leave me too. Right. So that became, that compounded with my Catholic faith, just started to put this toiling that I wasn't enough, but somehow I could earn it. So I was a good person, right? Everyone knows before, you know, I was a good person, right? But I wasn't, I wasn't living for the Lord. So fast forward, being raised very poor, I did graduate from high school, which was like a huge deal in my family. I went on to become a police officer and serve in the military. And I was about 23 years old, had served in the military and the Army National Guard a couple of years, had served as a police officer for a couple of years. And I was coming to the end of myself. And all this time, I was asking that question, why did my father not care enough? Mm -hmm. Right. What can I do to earn my salvation? What can I do to earn this relationship? And one night in 2016, uh, it was after a New Year's Eve party. I found myself understanding why my dad wanted to take his life. I truly got to a point where I can't be enough. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not adding any value to this world. And I finally empathized with him as to what it feels like to think the world would be better without you. So I was praying that night only for the strength to take my own life. I had my service pistol in my hand. I went home, I sat down on the ground in my bedroom and I just said, just end it. It'll hurt for a little while for my family, but I think the world will be better without me. Somehow, mother's intuition, my mom saw me leave this New Year's Eve party, small town, one stoplight. It's what every country song sings about. So everyone knows what everyone's <laughs> doing. So she knows I left the party and, and I was kind of down and usually I was the life of the party. So she said, I'm gonna go check on him. So she walks in and I hear her open the door and I hear her scream out my name. Just, hey, Keanu, what are you going to call me? Nuck. Hey, Nuck, are you, are you in here? And I'm just praying, you know, do I just do it? I just do it. And I know she'll see it, but I don't want her to stop me because I know I'm going to cause more pain. And she came to the door and she just froze. And I knew I, I, knew I couldn't do it, but I was praying for the strength. And then my sister, again, happens to show up to check on me. And she comes to the door and my mom just says, stop him, do something. And my sister, without hesitating, went and just threw herself on me and just wow. held me. And I threw the gun and I just held her and she held me. And now I see, just like when my dad tried to end his life, right. that it wasn't my sister walking into the room, it was Jesus. Amen. And when Amen. I worship and I think about connecting with him, I, I become yeah. tearful and I'm so grateful because I think about him kicking down that door and saying, I'm not gonna let you do this. Amen. Right, I'm, I'm going to come to you to have this relationship with you. And six months later, uh, I moved out of that small town and I went active duty with the Army National Guard and I got invited to a church service, much like this one. Right. And my buddy who we had played high school football together, he went to another college town. We happened to be meeting up in Albuquerque. I knew what he was like when we grew up. So him inviting me to church was kind of strange. So I thought when he said, let's go to church, 
I thought Catholic mass and it was a Wednesday night. And I said, no, let's go get a drink, you know, instead. And he's like, no, I'm going to church, but you know, I'll invite you again next week. And he stayed persistent with me. And then I went into a service like this one and I was floored. Great music. There's a light show. Why is the pastor so cool? Why is he dressing so cool? It was actually Levi Lusco. For those of you that are familiar with him, he's from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he spoke a word that finally made it make sense to me. And I had the answer to the question that I was asking all along. Why did my father not care enough? Why was my father not there? Why did my father abandon me? And I realized when Pastor Levi Lesko gave that message and gave an altar call and I jumped over the, 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 the rows, I was like, you know, between people and I didn't care. And I'm up in the balcony. A balcony. <laughs> I just jumped over and I'm running down and you know, tears streaming. I didn't know what was going on. When he spoke that message, I finally had the answer. My father never left me. Amen. My father never abandoned me. My father knew that I was enough. And my father in heaven, he was that one that I was trying to you know, hold my earthly father to this different standard. And that night I, I began a relationship with Jesus and I understood it's not about, about what I do. I'm not good enough. Amen. I was right that night. I'm not good enough. But I didn't have the second part. I'm not good enough, but Jesus was. Amen. And Amen. in right. building that relationship. Thank God. In, in building that relationship, it now it led me to my wife. She's also Catholic, and now we are, are on fire for the Lord and being able to have that connection to know that you are not good enough, but he is. And through him, as Pastor Ray will lead us through, you can be made whole. You can be made story. good enough. Thank God that God preserved his life. And so you got baptized as an adult, and your parents kind of looked at you like, what do we do with this, right? Yeah, my family said, so what are you, a, a Jehovah's Witness now or something? I, they just didn't <laughs> understand what, what it was. Well, so let's talk about some of the differences. We've got a couple of pictures. Let's just step out of the way so they can see this on the screen for just a moment. Let's, let's look at some where the similarities are in the difference. Here's, here's one in the middle. Here's what we share in common. Jesus lived, was crucified, and resurrected. We, communion and baptism are very important to us. We do those things, and we, those are for a very important reason. What makes us unique as Protestants is we believe salvation is the free gift of God and that you can't earn it, that only God can forgive sins, and regular church members help make decisions. In contrast... Our Catholic brothers and sisters believe Jesus offers salvation, but you must work to get it. That popes can forgive sins as well as priests, as emissaries of the Pope, and the only clergy make decisions in the church, whereas we believe in much more the ground is level at the foot of the cross and that everybody's involved in making decisions. So we have people that share leadership here. Here's another screen. Um, Look at this one. So we're going to learn a little bit about uh, some Latin today, and then we're going to talk about what it means actually in English. Here's the five things that started the Protestant Reformation. 1517, October 31st, uh, Martin Luther had been a Catholic priest, had seen abuses in the church. People were paying to get their sins, literally paying out of their pockets to get their sins forgiven. Um, He saw abuses among the way the priesthood was trained and those kinds of things. And so he nailed 95 theses, 95 different arguments on the door of a city gate in Wittenberg, and basically it was on then. And ultimately... What we serve now as Protestants, Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Pentecostals, those that are not Catholic are ultimately part of that movement. So what did he believe? Here's what he wrote down. First of all, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Sola, a sola is what that means actually in your Latin language. Sola gratia, which means grace alone or grace. Uh, sol- solus Christus means Christ alone. Sola fide means faith alone. And solo deo gloria means for God's glory alone. In contrast, our Catholic brothers believe in Scripture too. In large respect, they help to pull it together. Not exactly like ours, but very similar. But they also believe in the traditions involved in the church, plus the grace and human cooperation. Yeah, we believe in grace, but you also got to work. You got to prove it. Then Christ and the the church. So Christ is important, but the church also is important because it's the representation of Christ in the world. Then faith and good works. But glory to God, but there's also some special honor accorded to saints. There are people that are given sainthood because they've been really, really good. So let's unpack a lot of this, and Keanu's going to help to throw some things to it as we go through this. But if you open up your notes, if you're following along on the app, if you're watching online, or if you just want to follow along with us today, let's talk about the differences. First of all, sola scriptura, scripture alone. For all scripture is given by God. It's breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God and woman of God, by implication, may be complete, equipped for every good work. Literally, God has given us Scripture so that we can make it. You don't need me to interpret Scripture for you. You don't need Keanu to do it. You don't need anybody else to do it. 
God will give you the opportunity. Now, we do exercise skills to help interpreting it, but ultimately, Scripture alone is the center. Next, sola gratia, through grace alone. We can come to know Christ through grace alone. But God, as Paul wrote to a church in Ephesus, much like Mount Holly, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Say these words with me now if you see them on the screen. By grace, you have been saved. He even makes it even more specific later on. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast about it. We can't stick out our chest and say, yeah, look, I did that. Yeah, I volunteered to serve. Yeah, I gave a big gift to the church. Yeah, I helped the little lady across the street. Yeah, I made dinner for Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah, no. We depend upon the grace and the keeping power of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, sola Christus, in Christ alone. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt here among us, and we beheld his glory. We've seen that glory, John wrote in his gospel. That is the only begotten Son of the Father, the only Son, full of grace and truth. John one of Jesus' disciples was writing down, and he said, I saw God face to face, and his name was Jesus. That's what he's saying to us. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. What is the curse of the law idea? The curse of the law is the idea that, so here's a list of things, and if you do these things, then you're good and you're in. But, but what we discover by knowing the Ten Commandments, which are still not the Ten Suggestions, by the way, is that we've probably in some way, shape, or fashion, if not in letter, violated in some way. No, you didn't pick up a gun to shoot somebody like Thomas Brooks or whatever the guy's name was that did that yesterday, but we shoot people with our mouths, our thoughts. The point is, we're not good enough to be good enough to be saved. Then next, it comes by faith alone. Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone. So here's what Paul said. If anybody could have been saved because he was good, it was him. He was a leader of leaders. He was a super righteous guy. He was so righteous that he thought Christ's followers were against Judaism, and he would hunt them down and kill them before he was saved. It's a timely word to think about the man who wrote a third of the New Testament did what that man attempted to do last night regularly until Christ saved him. I've been crucified with Christ, Paul says. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Do you see what he's saying to us? Because this very same problem was happening back then. Back then, it was not about Protestantism versus Catholicism. It was about Christ following versus Judaism. You got to keep this list of things. You got to do all these things. Otherwise, you just don't get in. But then finally, we subscribe to this. Solo Deo Gloria. For God's glory alone. We live our lives for God's glory alone. Not for this church. I'm grateful that y'all are good commercials to this church <laughs> and this place and this place where people, please be a good commercial. More importantly, though, for Jesus Christ. Be the people that live it in such a way so that people know that there's hope in the world and there's faith in the world and there's grace in the world because there is a Jesus and the person you come encounter, come in, and encounter together is going to understand that they're encountering a person who is filled with Christ. And we believe that happens at the time that you were saved. Listen to these words, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Say this word, say this with me, not to us, not to us, not to us O, Lord, o Lord, but to your name, give glory for the sake of your steadfast love, the sake of your steadfast love. and faithfulness. faithfulness. That's what it about. So here's the deal. Here, here's the essence of it. For all of us. It is about salvation. If you want a formula, here it is. Here's what we believe. It is about salvation 
by grace, through faith, in Christ alone, plus nothing. Now, we hope you're going to be good. We hope you're going to do good works. God wants you to do that, but not because you've earned it. Instead, you're doing it because Christ has come to be good enough for you and for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, the folks in this room, folks watching online, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. But that the world through him might be saved. That's why he came. And so repeat after me. It is about salvation. Salvation. By grace. By grace. Through faith. Through faith. In Jesus, in Jesus, plus nothing. Plus nothing. So here's where we come today. I mean, you shared a powerful story with us today. How, how would you, as we land this, this plane, so to speak, and as we bring this to a place where we're, we're going to call you to make a decision, tell us what's on your mind. I want to empathize with Nate. Nate, thank you for sharing your story of being raised Baptist and then finding a deeper relationship with the Lord and Catholic and to all of our Catholic brothers and sisters as well, especially in this community and all the good they do. As he said in his message, if we can talk about the, if we agree on the big things, that it is through Christ alone, we can talk about the little things. Yeah. We understand where we can connect there and understand why you like to practice the way you do. Because just like my story, his story was the opposite. It, and it wasn't Christ. It wasn't our father, it was the people. He didn't feel like he could ask questions. I didn't feel like I could ask questions. He didn't feel like he could be good enough. I didn't feel like I could be good enough. He was longing for the father, I was longing for the father. And so all of us being able to connect and empathize in that way, for us in the room, your children may be telling this story one day themselves. Well, I was raised in the church, I was raised Protestant. It was just something we were, but I didn't really understand what relationship with Jesus meant. Don't confuse, I wrote this down because as, as Pastor Ray said, I did find myself into ministry at one point and, and I absolutely absolutely was, was guilty of this. Don't confuse working for Christ with working with Christ. Yeah. Being alongside, working with your father, getting up every day and saying, it's not just that, oh, it's something I do. It's really a genuine relationship. Right. And the last thing I'll say, when I was in that mindset that I couldn't earn it, that I couldn't do enough, right? That I could somehow earn salvation, which if we're honest, you should feel that often because you have that question because we're sinful in our nature, but we've been made whole, right? There was a thought that it actually meant a greater level of salvation if I could do all those things, right? What if I could do all of these things and reach all these standards? I paid that price. I'm better. And what I know now is there's no greater price than the blood of Jesus. Yeah. There's yeah. no greater value in the world than the blood of Jesus. So it doesn't make it a more premium salvation, salvation plus, right? right. Salvation prime. It actually cheapens it yeah. to say that I could earn it. Right. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos could put their money together and they could not buy the kingdom of God. Amen. That's How right. could we think that we can earn it? It's only through Jesus and his price was enough and that is the ultimate price to, play, to pay and having that relationship with him is what allows us to go to the Father with confidence, without intercession, Amen. without having to approach Mary or the saints and now have that relationship directly because our Father wants that with us and he's always been there and he's been walking with you too. Amen. Amen. So what are the major differences? First, the, the authority of Scripture. Not scripture plus tradition, scripture plus interpretation of the man who happens to be the pope or the bishops that serve under him that day. Also, the authority of leadership and honor. We believe the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that, that we make decisions together, we serve God together without that structure and that hierarchy, a formal one, although we do have somebody that's in charge. That happens to be me here. But we work together with the team that makes decisions for the life of our church, for instance. And then finally, the authority, the means of salvation. So don't be confused here today. You're going like, so are y'all saying that they're just as right as we are? No, we believe we're writer. <laughs> All right, here's the deal. They believe they're writer, but here's what we have in common. We have Jesus in common, crucified, dead, buried, resurrected. We have the love of God coming to the world practically through people. Listen, Holy Angels does something unlike any other organization in all the world, and we are grateful and proud and honored to do the partnership with them. Um, I have done and performed funeral services with Placid Solari, who is the abbot, the leader of the, the Belmont Abbey. And listen, if abbot's not a believer, I'm not a believer. He's, a, he's the real deal. All right. So, so we, but we, we're different. <laughs> we're different and we believe in worshiping in different ways. 
but we still have respect for one another because he's a leader, I'm a leader. We, he loves Jesus, I love Jesus. But we believe salvation comes by grace through faith in Christ alone. So, so what today? Here's the big so what for you. If you're asking, what's, what's the deal here? God wants you to be right with him. And there are definite differences between us and our Catholic brothers with the core similarity of love and sacrifice in the resurrection of Jesus. Today, if you've heard God's voice, and maybe you've wrestled with this all of your life, you've been trying to earn it, earn it, earn it, earn it. You don't have to. Christ has earned it for you. Are you sure you belong to Jesus Christ? Have you made that at the core of your life in that decision? And are you right with God? You can be sure today. And here's how. Would you bow your heads and hearts in prayer? Today, if, if you found, heard yourself in the counter story, or maybe even Nate's story and that kind of stuff, it's fascinating that, that God has brought all kinds of people in the life of our church, and we're just grateful we can answer the questions like this honestly. But this is about you right now. Do you believe in the grace and the faith and the keeping power of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and Master? Today, if you heard God's voice before this day and you've heard him knock in all of your life, you can be assured on July the 14th at 1040 a.m., I have decided to follow Jesus and there's no turning back. I'm giving him my life. How do you do that? If you, you say this prayer, I encourage you to repeat it after me, whether you want to say it out loud or silently, and you mean it from the core of your being, God is already accepting you and his family. He is throwing open the door. There's a party starting in heaven. But here's the, here's the prayer. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. Dear Jesus, I'm following you now. So I want to invite everybody to pray that. Perhaps while you're praying this, and if you are a believer already, you're going to help it, make it possible for somebody that has not done so together. Would you all pray this together with me? Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. Dear Jesus, I'm following